When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless my heart. I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. St. Luke's chapter 5. Anybody else has it? Chapter yeah. 5, yes. Okay. King James Version reads this such. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answered, answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net, their net break, and they beckoned unto their, their, their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. And when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I want to talk to you on a sermon entitled Your Network Builds Your Network. Your Network Builds Your Network. Let's pray. Father in heaven, hide me behind the cross. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Strengthen all of you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we live in a, a highly connected society today. What used to take a letter a couple of days to get from one side of the coast to the other side of the coast where we call it snail mail now the US Postal Service so if we wanted to send a letter from New York City to California it would take anywhere between one and seven days but we live in a time in a, in a, in a, in a time where we're so well connected now that we've advanced from snail mail to email where we can send a message not only from the East Coast to the West Coast, but around the world, and we could do it in just a few seconds. Where it would have one time taken us seven days to do it. And if you even go back faster, I mean, you go back uh, to, a, to, a, to a slower time, 
uh, back in the days, it was the Pony Express, and when people had telegrams, and after telegrams, there were Morse codes, and, and now we are so connected. They, uh, Facebook is the social network epicenter of the world. You got people from Africa, people from Indonesia, people from Bangladesh, people from China, people from Japan, all linked in and linked up, able to talk to one another. Uh, technology has become so advanced in being connected and linked up that now if you are not present to come and see your grandbaby brought into, brought into existence, you can watch it on a camera while they're delivering your grandbaby right on Skype. <laughs> now I remember, I, I'm, I'm from the old school, I remember when when we were growing up, we ain't had no cell phones. You know, when beepers came out, we thought we were it. Those beepers, <laughs> we walk around with those beepers and look, we, we see, look and see, like, oh, who, but I don't know what that number is. And we went to a phone booth. Nowadays, you can't hardly find a phone booth because everybody walking around with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. People so connected now, people, some people have dropped their house phone and they just deal with a cell phone and they iPad or they iTouch, mm -hmm. you know, all these different things. We so connected that we disconnect. Mm. Mm. So many ways to talk and link up, but there's a major disconnection. You see it every time you ride the bus, every time you ride the train. You you hear the young people in the back. Cause we still program. We we don't even stay in the front of the bus. We we go straight to the back. It was a time when we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't be in the front, but we, we still program, we still going straight to the back of the bus. <laughs> we hear their conversations, and, and, and when we listen to them, we, 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 we realize that when we were growing up, we were bad, and we did our thing and all that, but we ain't broadcast, we ain't advertised, we didn't put all our business out on Front Street the way that they do. And then, they got a nerve to be real loud with it, and proud with it. And so when they disrespectful and you, you got your little lad, which you got your little daughter or your little son or you got your grandson or you got your nephew or niece, they spitting all these different things about this one is doing that one and, and all this. And, and when, you, when you try to check some of them, some of them are like, what you talking about? We see the disconnect in some, how some of these young people have no respect for their older generation. The other day I was, I was in route, I was going to the doctor. And there was three boys. I was at 96th Street. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I was coming from the doctor. I was on my way to Brooklyn. And um, these boys were probably about eight, maybe nine. And they're talking. And they're talking, you know, they're talking, they talking street slang. And I know it because, you know, I'm from the streets. But an average older person wouldn't know what they were talking about. But then it wasn't just that they was talking in code. And, and... And the things they were saying was just, I mean, these guys are young. And so I'm hearing things that's coming out of their mouth, and they start cursing. I was like, hold up, hold up, yo, fellas, come in. I said, yes. I was like, don't curse. I was like, what y'all cursing for? We sorry, sir. I'm like, don't do that. You see this lady right here, have respect for your elders. Don't curse in front of them. So he's like, I'm sorry, sir. We sorry. And I said, stop calling young women out of their names. You eight years old. What you know about that? You eight, nine years old, how old are you? My boy is like nine. Oh my goodness. So we we seeing these things happening when we in transition, when we go on places and so forth. And so there's kind of a disconnect because we live in a society now where people think they can say anything and everything around anyone at any time, any place, and anywhere. Connected yet disconnected. And, and then there's a part where we all know that it takes a village to raise a child, but, but what happens in the village? Now the village is shutting down. The village, the older folks say, listen, the young people don't listen to me, so I'm not going to speak no more truth to them. I'm not going to drop no more Jews on them. I'm not going to each one teach one no more. I'm packing up my bags and I'm shutting down shop. So, so where does that leave? Where does that leave? the future of our races? Where does that leave the future of our people if we cannot speak and address uh, what's going on, if we're not able to, to, to reach out and speak out and connect with the 
younger generation, the older generation, and bridge the gap so that each generation, no matter if they were born in the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, or in the two, 2000s, can connect and still have respect for one another and still show love for one another and still share with one another. We got so much in common. Yet we act like we don't have the common denominator. We 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 let, we, we we learn traditions through through word of mouth, and we taught stories. When we the older older generation, they shared stories with us, and, and and we listened, and we heard what they said, and we carried those on and passed those down to our children. But if we get quiet about that, they're gonna start hearing the the the, the, the stories out on the streets. If we not share them, the gang's gonna start sharing. Them. Come here, let me holler at you, Phil. Oh, your moms ain't buying you those new Jordans? I got you, son. Come on, we can go down the block. I'm going to get you. You want the red and white pair? Mm -hmm. So if we're not spending time with our children, there's always somebody else that's willing to spend time with our children. Now, I love this story because there's so this story is so rich, but it's, 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 it's so rich that oftentimes we don't get all of the nutrients, all of the spiritual nutrition out of it. When I look at it, I think about uh, we find Jesus at a place where we saw him before when he had uh, healed the demoniac, when, when, when the demoniac who was, who was trapped and, and he was marginalized from his town and pushed out of society. They pushed him out of society and brought him into a cemetery. We, we, we find that the man was from Genazareth. And now we see Jesus again at Genazareth. But now as Jesus is at Genazareth, he, he links up with Peter, James, and John. And he says, Peter, so many people I'm preaching and the people are pressing me now. They're pressing me. Uh, it, it's the, the, the crowd is so thick. It's so many people that we need to get into a ship and just push out the ship just a little bit. Just so I can preach from the ship. So I see Jesus now. I see Peter pushing out with Jesus now. I see them out on the shore. Just not, not, not far, but just in a little distance, just in a little distance, Christ is preaching, he's preaching the word of God, and the people are still attentive to hear what Jesus is saying, but then Jesus, in the midst of his sermon, says to Peter, what we're going to do now, in the midst of preaching, he just stops Halts. Nobody stops his sermon but him. Jesus stops in the middle of his sermon and he says to Peter, listen, I want you to take your net and drop your net down. Which is the first thing. A lot of times we have done certain things and we have walked in our purpose. We've walked in our gifts and we tried something over and over and it seems as though we are not producing. Something is just not happening. We're working day and night. We're sweating, toiling, twisting and turning, doing everything right. We're, we're using all the proper equipment, but we're out all night and we have no return on our investment. Mm. Mm. Jesus says, listen, I want you to understand the power inside of the net and the power of listening to my proclamation. Drop your net into the water. Mm. Many of us, it just reminds me, this takes me back to when, when Jesus first called uh, Peter and them when he was walking along the shore and they were chilling with their dad after nobody in society wanted to bring them in and usher them to be disciples of their own. After everybody had passed them along and they couldn't be a disciple of anyone, they had to work with their father on a ship. They became fishermen because that was their father's trade. They could not be a, a theologian of their day. They could not be taught by Gamaliel. They had to stay in the hood. They had to cut, they had to go and fish for fish and clean fish. And that was their lot until Jesus, who who <laughs> Who we were talking about last week, how when he left the desert after 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 he was tempted by Satan, after he became victorious in his showdown in the desert, and he let the devil have it and the, and the devil ran. We find him now 
along the shore and Peter and them are fascinated and they see him and he says follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and see listen God doesn't just call us one time he's always calling us he called them then but now we see him in a different situation we know that they were still walking with Jesus we know that when he called them he told them uh, drop your nets and one set were mending their nets because they were working all night and the nets ripped meaning that they were they were making some progress and they were capturing some things, but they were trying to mend the nets and the, and the other ones were just coming back and they were washing theirs because they'd already gone through the mending process because they had to mend the they had to mend the nets that were messed up. They would mend them and then they would wash them. And so when they would dry, they'd be nice and strong. So so Jesus uh, called two and he walked down and called two more. And we see all of them in this story now. We see all of them. Jesus is preaching and he says, drop your net. And that's what he's saying to us today. Many of us looking to find the perfect job, to find the perfect pay bracket. We're looking to find, and God is saying, drop your nets. Why is he saying that? For one, many of us think, Because God has given us a gift, has given us talent, that those things are going to add, multiply, quadruple, and guess what? It's not in those things. Many of us, because um, of, 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 of programming on the parts of the things that we've been through in life, Many of us have really lost sight of what it is to let go of the net. We so used. See, every time since, since we've been kids, when, when, when our parents were feeding us with bottles that we couldn't hold by ourselves, they would hold it. And when we got old enough, we start holding it with our own hands. And every since we've been drinking on our own, every since we've been walking on our own, every since we've been tying our shoes on our own, every since we've been dressing ourselves by ourselves, we have this idea that I can do it, God. I got this. Biggest lie ever told. I want to cover some things and I wrote them up here so you guys can always jot them down. I left them up here for a reason. One of the major things about dropping your net is learning the misinterpretation of scripture that keeps you in financial bondage of swimming in debt. In debt, swimming in debt. <laughs> and that is, there's a scripture that many of us were taught at home and in church. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. But we misinterpret it. We misinterpret it this way. We say, oh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's not what God said. <laughs> Are you listening to me? This right here, this one particular area is so important, it will save your life financially. If you don't believe me, ask Mike Tyson and he'll tell you, I was a millionaire. I had everything. I had, Lamb I had a Lamborghini. I had a big mansion. But guess what? Because I did not know the power in dropping my net, because I did not know that it's not money Money is not the root of all evil. Money is just a principal exchange to get to buy and exchange goods. But if you believe that money is the root of all evil, guess what? No matter how much money you have, you'll always get rid of it. That's why drug dealers can't keep money. That's why they always spend it. I know about it because I used to do those things. I know about it. As much as it comes in, the quicker it goes out. That's why NBA players, they can ball till they fall and get it in and shoot ball like Jordan. But when guess what? When they leave the NBA, 60% of them go broke because they don't know this principle. 60% of them go broke. They have to give up their home. They have to give up their car. They owe the IRS and they got to look for now a reality show to help revive and bring some capital into their situation. 
If we get that one principle, our whole financial dynamic will shift. See, guess what? One of the things about uh, about this particular principle is that um, if you don't know it, right? The first thing money looks like to you. Every, let me let me let me let me let me break this down as simple so a three year old can get it. Every one of us have a has a money image, how money looks to us, and I'm not talking about how a twenty dollar bill or a ten dollar bill or one dollar bill or a five dollar bill looks. I'm talking about a principle. It's just like when I think of prestige, when I think of something illustrious, I think of a castle. That's the image for me. So, so many times when we look at money, when we have a bad interpretation of money, money looks like Jason from Friday the 13th. So every time it's in our pocket, we can't help but get rid of it. We don't know how to say it because we're like, uh-uh, uh-uh. We have to make the image. We have to change the image and we shift the dynamic. When you change it, when you change the image, see, see, back in the days, money always looked like King Kong to me. So every time I would get it, I would dish it out and I would back up. I would dish it out and I would back up. And then the next thing you know, I didn't have nothing. And I felt happy. And I felt good. And, and, and in church, they kind of reinforce it. They kind of reprogram you to believe that the love of money is the love of money. It's not money. It's the love of money. Right. When, when, when you have the love of money, that means that if somebody pay, you will do any and everything to get it. But see, God said, listen, you ain't got to do every, any and everything to get it. I will bless you in abundance. Not just in abundance, in super abundance. That's why I, I made it plain that delight thyself in the Lord and, <laughs> and he'll provide for you. That's why, that's why if you ask David, he said, God is my strength and power and he make up my way perfect. And if you ask David a second time, he'll say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if you ask Paul, he'll say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The testimony is in the word of God, and God will always make it plain. But we got to pay attention. We got to pay attention. See this first principle? Mike Tyson had a problem with that. Zab Judah had a problem with that. That's why, as long as they was handling their nets, as long as they was handling their nets, it seemed like everything was okay. But as soon as the net dropped, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as the net dropped, that's when they were able to prosper. It wasn't in, notice, Mike Tyson is one of the greatest heavyweight of all time. But notice, after boxing is when people started loving him because he dropped the net. <laughs> he dropped the net. People start seeing Mike Tyson for who he was, and they say he's not a bad character. That's why he was always playing the bad guy because he had a bad concept of money. That's why he was playing the bad guy that he was playing. The second thing that we need to understand is the five levels of accumulation. We are all born, born and birthed into a certain situation. <laughs> and, 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 and this is the tricky part. Is the powerful but it's tricky. Listen, when we're children, right? We're fearless. It doesn't matter if we came from the ghetto or the suburbs. We little evil canevils. <laughs> we don't believe we we if somebody said, can you do this? We ain't asking all, we not thinking about I can't do it, we gonna try to do it. But guess what? When we get older, we lose all that. Oh. The risk is just too much. <laughs> I can't run up them stairs the way I used to. <laughs> boy, I ain't young like that no more. You, you saw my going up against the powers of be, boy. I'm too, I'm too old for that. I, I, they might cut my pension. <laughs> Your net birth has two sides to it: a heads and a tail. The heads is you understand who you are, and you will move. Above and beyond the call of duty. The tail side of it is, when you start getting older, we start using the things that we felt held us down. So if we grew up in the hood, the hood ain't got no love for me. We got the Biggie Smalls principle. <laughs> more money, more problems. And if we start thinking like that, guess what's going to happen? Yeah, guess what's going to happen? 
We're going to start seeing that show up. If we believe more money, more problems, then if that King Kong that I told you about, that image, that's always going to be coming up here stomping in the yard. He's like, whoa, here you go, take it all. I don't want no more. Okay, I'm good. So that's the second part of the net birth. But your net pain, this is important. I grew up in the hood. I grew up in Bushwick. I remember, I knew where I came from when I first when I first was born, we lived in Flatbush. At the age of one, we moved to Bushwick. So, net pain is this. Mike Tyson had net pain and, and Zab Jr. had net pain. They both from the hood. They both came from Brownsville. They came from nothing. Like many of Don King's fighters, came from nothing. They knew what it was to be hungry and have their ribs touching. They knew what it was that they had to share clothes with their siblings. They knew what it was the lights might go out if mom went and got that extra food or whatever like that. Just living from paycheck to paycheck. Net pain a lot of times, being stuck in this particular level messes a lot of people up. A lot of times because of the net pain, seeing how the scenario is, seeing how where they grew up looks, many times that impression is so hard for us to shake that it's just like a monkey on our back. I knew what it was. That, see, when, when my mom and my dad were together, I got sneakers every week, and I kid you not. I went to the movies every week, and I kid you not. I went to almost every Yankee game because my pops was a Yankee fan. We was always at the Yankee games. We were always at the movies. On, we went to the movies on Saturday and Sunday. Saturdays, we, we go, we'll go to Manhattan, and on Sundays, we would go <laughs> down to Flatbush and go watch the um, Bruce Lee karate flicks. Double feature, grind house, grind house style. Grind house, rather. And so it was always money flowing. Always. If I was playing Coco Leave You Outside and I came in with a rip on my shirt, my mom was like, what you doing? Come on, we going shopping. And I'm like, well, I don't want to go shopping. I don't like this shit. I'm sold up. No, we going shopping. But then when my mom and my dad separated, things started looking different. And they ain't just separate because of separation. I'm going to keep it real. I always keep it 100, and I like to keep people in the loop. When my mom and my pops broke up, my uncle and my father always had beef. They were always at odds. And my uncle put a hit out on my dad. So, and my mom, who could have stepped in and shut that down, she didn't. So that caused friction, so I couldn't see my dad like I wanted to, so my net pain was growing. Mm. My net pain was growing, and so instead of me elevating, I started descending mm. into a whole different character because now I'm looking, I'm seeing my mother struggling. So that net pain is getting to me, and I'm like, you know what? I can't have my mom struggling like this, so I got to get my hustle game and bring my muscle game and go get this money to make sure mommy is good. I can hold my brother down and hold my sister down. Net pain can change your whole life. This is one of the reasons why a lot of young brothers and sisters get locked up. Because of this net pain, sometimes certain things are snatched away from us prematurely that we can't handle. And when it's snatched away from us, we go to pieces. And it's not because we're weak or anything, but when we're trying to elevate, when we're in the stages of growing up in life, when things happen that push us down. It's hard to put that in reverse. It's, it's hard to grow up to learn what being a man is all about when the man has left the house. But you could graduate from net pain. James Brown didn't grow up in a house like mine. James Brown, God bless his heart, James Brown was in an orphanage. But he allowed that net pain to fuel him to be the greatest entertainer of all times. He's influenced more uh, rockers, more R&B singers, more people than and he influenced Michael Jackson. Net pain can take you to a whole nother realm of excellence if you allow it. If you, if you let that pain, if you focus that anger and generate it in a talent. 
James got it down on his dance, and he made sure his steps was smooth and in groove. He 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 performed so he was he was a beast with it. He did his thing thing <laughs> at the Apollo and everywhere. Nobody wanted to go on stage after James Brown. <laughs> Nobody. The Rolling Stones. One time they had a concert, and James Brown did his thing. The Rolling Stones said, "Listen, y'all gonna have to find us. You can't go on behind them. That's a bad man." <laughs> As Ali said, they ain't want to go behind you. <laughs> but this is where we, when we get to net gain, net gain really, what net gain actually does is it gives us the opportunity to understand that the power is not in the net. The power is in trusting God to let go of the net. Because that's where the net gain happens when you drop the net. See, little becomes big in the hands of God. And when we hit rock bottom, we just where God wants us to be. When we ain't got nothing, all we got is trusting in something. Yeah. We, we can't lose with the stuff that we use because yeah. God will do amazing things to those who will render those nets to Him. Yeah. They drop those nets. And the word of God says that there was tremendous net gain. So much so that the boat that, 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 that Jesus told them to push out into the deep with, that boat became overflowing. They said, they, they, they flagged the other boat was like, yo, come help us. Boat started sinking. It was so much net gain. Which takes us to network. Notice how they understood that they could not do this work by themselves. Even with Jesus in the ship, they needed somebody else with another ship to work together. That's why our network builds our net worth. So they call the other fish advice. And they said, you know what? <laughs> we got so much fish, we both can double up. So what it means is God will quadruple everything he blesses you with if you just drop the net. You won't have enough room to receive what God wants to do for you if you just trust him and drop the net. So when they network collectively, if you put a dollar amount on it, Think about this. Now they go fishing. They have a fishing business. They know what it is to catch fish and they know what it is not to catch fish. But you know they had a serious load of fish. When they put the net down, the net start breaking. They put the fish on the boat. The boat starts sinking. They had another boat. So think about it. If they sell a fish for a couple of shekels and a couple of coins, guess what? They got the mother load. They never, whenever they go fishing, they never bring back a huge haul like that. But you always bring back a huge haul when you follow what God has told you to do. More than you can ever imagine. You be weighed down in blessings. God will cause an avalanche of abundance to fall on you. And you be like, oh, <laughs> whoa, what's going on? Just because you follow. Just because you follow what he's saying. And then, which brings us to three, really, unleashing the discipleship matrix. This part is important. Because remember what I told you? When he called Peter and James and John, when he called all of them by the shore, he called two, then he called another two. Do you know how much your life will change? If you get the concept of unleashing the discipleship matrix, Jesus called four. How many? How many disciples did Jesus have? Anybody? Mm -hmm. He started out with twelve, right? Yeah. yeah. He had twelve. Okay. I want you to see something. Twelve is a powerful number. Mm -hmm. Jacob, <coughs> who God named Israel, <coughs> had twelve sons. Each one a representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. In heaven, there's 12 gates. There's 12 pearly gates. <laughs> there's something powerful about the number 12. When Jesus 
was unleashing the discipleship matrix, what he was doing was calling four people to call four more people and for those four more people to bring four more people. See, the reason why Christ has not come yet is because we are not unleashing the discipleship matrix. Jesus called four and those four called four more and those four called another four and they rolled every one of them had their own set of 12 and if all we did was to do that we could turn the whole world upside down yeah but there's too many egos mm. well, people <laughs> say oh I I'm going to use um, Bobby's method he got the, the biggest church in the world I'm, I'm going to use a uh, I'm going to use A.R. Bernard's model because he got a huge, he has a huge congregation. I'm going to use Nelson Searcy's model. But guess what? If you use Jesus' model, it keeps multiplying. It keeps reproducing. It's like a snowflake. If you look at a snowflake, it has so many different dimensions. There's nothing <laughs> when you look at one snowflake underneath a microscope and another, they don't look the same. But collectively, they all operate under the same DNA genetic code. Mm. And so if we only did what Christ did, notice that 12, by the time you go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you get to the Acts of the Apostle, when you see them, see, this is why people are stuck a lot of times. Because people are staying behind locked church doors. The same way the disciples were after Jesus Christ was crucified. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we got the power up in here. They praise God all day. <laughs> praise Him all day. Then they go home. But they go home and their husband is hurting. Their children are hurting. They ain't got time to help their kids do their homework. You a star in church. But you a bum in the house. Mm. You ain't taking care of business. You ain't paying no bills. You ain't being there for your kids. Your kids are, are, are crying for your attention. He's like, leave me alone, son. I, I got I got to go to church. We got a meeting at the church. We got this at the church. We going bowling, and I'll see you when I get back. We probably spend about an hour on, on Sunday night when I get back home. But the kid is tired. You ain't helped him or her with their homework. And in a couple of hours, they got to go to sleep because they on curfew. But their homework ain't done. They needed you to help navigate them through their homework. But you were so churched up and churched out that you locked them out and locked them away. He said, no, no, but I'm just doing the Lord's work. The Lord's work starts at home. We notice when those four disciples and all of those people that were following Jesus, when this fish slow came, and they made it to the shore. Notice this. That the boat was sinking. But they made it. It's a good. This is why Jesus only told them to launch out just a little ways out. Because if they were in the middle of the ocean, both of the boats would have sunk. Because, because when you trust God, when you trust God, He will send you more fishes than you can hold. Than your neck can hold. Than your boat could hold. But we have to continue to keep unleashing the discipleship matrix because it keeps multiplying and multiplying and quadrupling and going to the second power and to the third power and to the fourth power because God is the omnipotent power, the omnipotent one. And so he never subtracts from himself. He only adds, multiplies, and he keeps advancing it. And that's why his model is the truth. And no other model looks like it, acts like it, or sound like it because it's omnipotent. Nothing can stop it. Nothing the devil throws at it. That's why Christ said, Peter, who do you say I am? Peter said, you're the son of God. And he said, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, not that I'm building on Peter, but upon this rock of faith, I'm building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But only if you're doing it this way. Because you could have a you could have a, the biggest church in the world. But if people aren't transformed, guess what? It ain't no difference than Planet Fitness. 
It ain't no difference than ah. It ain't no difference. All it is is a country club. People coming in, paying for some services, and going home. They eat their little spiritual food and go back out the same way they came. That was a good meal and keeping it moving. And the fourth most important is the master key to unlocking super abundance. And that master key is obedience. The master key is obedience. When God gives you a direct, when he shows you something directly and he says, just drop the net. Notice this. Obedience gave Peter enough sense to drop the net, but it didn't stop there. Obedience was so powerful that when Peter dropped the net and the fish was loaded up and they were rolling those fish onto that boat and the boat started rocking like this, it gave him enough knowledge and enough wisdom to network. <laughs> to call the other people, come here, come here. I need your help. I ain't worried about if you getting it, you getting the blue fish or the or the red snapper or the porgy or the bass. Just come get this fish. We all can eat together. Let's get this fish together and do God's work together. <laughs> Obedience gave him enough knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And that knowledge, wisdom, and understanding allowed them and, and two boat full of fish. Way down, going on slow mode. The boat probably was rocking like this, going back to the shore. But they made it. And when they made it, notice this. Peter jumps out of the boat and bows down before Christ and says, well, he's like, go away from me. Go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Go away from me. I don't even deserve to see nothing like this. Go away from me, Lord. Just go away from me. I can't be here the second I, I, I ain't equipped for all of this. You doing stuff like this. I ain't never seen this. I've been fishing. I've seen my dad. I've been on fishing trips with my dad since I've been a little kid. I ain't never seen nothing like this. My father is a master fisherman, and he can't do nothing like this. Go away from me. I can't be around you. And Jesus said, fear not. From this point on, You'll be fishes of men. That's what God called us to be. Fishes of men. That's why we got to understand that we need to get through all of these five levels of accumulation. There's some things that happen at our net birth. Remember, stay on the head side. Forget about the tail. The head side is to, 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 to be fearless, to walk into all that is good, all that God has called you to, 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 to doubt, feel the fear, but still do it anyway. And then notice, like, whenever we find ourselves getting angry or pained about something, notice that that's the inner child in us speaking that net pain, but we can use that net pain to pull a James Brown and become the greatest <laughs> entertainer of the world. I'm crazy. Michael Jackson went through net pain too because Joe Jackson was a hard pops to grow up under. <laughs> under he, he, he used that net pain to become another bad man with jammer. <laughs> he, he used that. And, and look, he didn't stop. He said, you know what? I got a bad... My dad is, my dad is a beast, but I'm going to look up this Jackie Robinson, he's a good, I'm going to look at him, I'm going to look at James Brown, I'm going to use them as my, my spiritual fathers, and, and I'm going to go places because I see how they get down, and I'm going to use that to my advantage and elevate my game. When that happens in that game, and when you start networking, do you know that everybody that you know, if you count seven people, you're only four people away from somebody that you need who has something that you want. Mm -hmm. But if we don't want to network, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. If Peter didn't the network, that ship would have sank and Jesus would have had to perform a miracle. Had to give Peter aqua lung or something. <laughs> <laughs> there was no life preservers then. That's true. There was no life jacket. That's one of the things that's strangling our, strangling our productivity and our success. Because mm -hmm. we don't want to trust in our network. I don't mess with Sally no more because she gets on my nerves. Mm -hmm. I don't mess with my brother no more. Anytime we get in, we always get in an argument. Stop looking for an argument. 
Stop expecting an augment. Guess what? An augment might not show up. When we start looking at things differently, mm -hmm. the world changes. Mm -hmm. And it looks different. Mm -hmm. Every day is about in God's house. Lord, we thank you for your magnificent word. There's nothing like it on the planet. Lord, we thank you for this powerful message that has taught us many things that we may not have known before. But Lord, help us to keep on leashing to keep on leashing the discipleship matrix in our lives. Keep telling people. Keep getting four people and bringing four more and helping them gain four more. So that, Lord, we can together turn this world upside down. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, the church said. Amen. Amen. As you go, tell the world. As you go, tell the world. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love. As you go, it goes like this. Tell the world. As you go, tell the world. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about His love. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about His love.